Hello, everyone. I'm Matthew Goldberg from the Cebu Board of Governors and consumer banking reporter at Bankrate. On behalf of Cebu, welcome to today's webinar on covering the economic impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We have a great moderator and panel here today. Our moderator is Heather Rothman, News Director of Bloomberg Government. Joining us as panelists today are Anna Wong, Chief U.S. Economist for Bloomberg Economics, John Hilsenrath, Senior Writer for, for the Wall Street Journal, is also here, and Eleanor Mueller, Reporter on Politico's Economics Team, rounds out our panel. Additional information about our speakers is at Cebu.org. To our listeners, if you have a question for the panel, please drop it in the Zoom. Those questions will get to Heather, and Heather will be posing them to the panel. Also, feel free to use the hashtag Cebu on Twitter. With that, I'll hand things over to Heather. Heather? Thank you, Matt, for that wonderful intro, and thank you to our panelists, and welcome to this look at the economic impacts of the Russian invasion on Ukraine. We have just begun the second week since Vladimir Putin's Russia started pounding Ukraine. We are seeing disturbing images of death and destruction and more than a million people fleeing to neighboring countries. We are seeing Western countries banding together to unveil economic sanctions of historic proportions on Russia. Another thing we are seeing is just how interconnected and codependent so many companies and countries are. Normally, we would ask the panelists to give an opening statement, but this group is so eager to have a free-flowing discussion and conversation that we have agreed to skip the opening statements and just go straight to the Q&A. As Matt said, if you have a question, please put it in the chat and I will try to get to it um, during this program. So let's dive right in. Um, I would like to start with you, John, on something that you've been reporting on in recent days. We are two years into this COVID era and the US economy appeared to be rebounding from the winter surge of COVID-19 infections. With a war happening half a world away, is the US economy positioned to absorb the current shock? Uh, well, I'll give you a short answer and a long answer. Uh, the, the short answer is yes, um, but the long answer is more complicated than that. Uh, you, you know, if you think about shocks that have hit the United States over the last 20, 30 years, they tend to be what we would call demand shocks. Uh, the tech bubble bursting in 2000, uh, the housing bubble bursting in the mid 2000s. These were shocks that uh, that 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 led to declines in household wealth, banks' unwillingness to lend. They sapped demand, caused recessions, and led to increases in unemployment. Right. So we tended to think about these shocks as something that would cause a recession, and we tended to ask questions as journalists, like, "Well, what are policymakers going to do about that to to offset the unemployment shock?" I think what we've seen in the last two years are what you would call supply side shocks, uh, not shocks that hit demand in the economy, but that shocks that hit supply, the ability of companies to uh, provide goods and services to workers. And this Ukraine shock is one of those. That's why energy prices are going up. We're seeing oil, oil and natural gas supplies being limited uh, in global markets. The supply shock doesn't work the same way as demand shock. It doesn't lead necessarily to recession. It leads to more inflation. So there is economic pain. It just presents itself differently. And so that's why we're writing so many stories right now with the journal about inflation. I think that's how we have to look at it. And the policymaker response to that is totally different than the policymaker response to demand side shock. Demand is really strong in the US economy right now. We're going to get numbers out of the Labor Department um, tomorrow that show hundreds of thousands of more workers added to the uh, labor force in the month of February while the, while the invasion happened, the unemployment rate falling. So I just think we have to think about this event totally differently than we've gotten used to thinking about events in the last 20 years. Thank you for that. Um, let's stay on that for a second. Anna, could you talk about how do you think the Fed will deal with the double hit of inflation and conflict spikes in prices? And do you see rate hikes really taking us into recession going forward? Yeah, so uh, 
you know, at the core of how the Fed thinks about this, uh, the geopolitical conflict is, as John said, it is interpreted as uh, through the lens of a supply shock. But in additionally, there's also the shock of uh, uncertainty. And from the Fed's, Fed's perspective, uncertainty shock could be a demand shock. So um, from the supply side, uh, usually the, the, the Fed would look through the, the energy price spike and even the, the, you know, the general equilibrium model that the Fed staff use would show that um, inflation would spike in the current quarter from the energy price shock. But if the energy prices were to stay at, let's say, $120 per barrel, then um, the 12 month inflation would decline uh, in, in the future quarters. So, you know, a Fed model would actually say, um, yeah, and in, in the next couple quarters, it would actually be disinflationary. So it's a, like a transitory inflation shock. On the other hand, the uncertainty shock, actually the effects would be amplified over the next few quarters on growth, dragging on growth. So uh, we think that the Fed will interpret the geopolitical event as on net, um, they would be more concerned about the growth effect towards the, toward, towards the second half of this year. And whereas given that, you know, the most important FOMC members all believe that inflation expectations is anchored at 2% right now, they would look through the initial um, inflationary shock. Now, uh, do, do I think that they're right in that assessment? So, so that's what I think the Fed would do. They would like be, be more net, on net more dovish this year relative to before the war happened. Uh, but I, I don't think they should look through the energy price shock. I think that expectations are teetering at the point of unanchoring. Um, and Fed stuff does not really have a good model of how expectations unravel. You know, the, the, the indicators that they look at don't even have a good track record of showing, you know, ahead of time that expectations are unraveling. But, you know, Fed staff are very data independent. It's very hard to convince, you know, Fed staff to take this leap of faith based on anecdotes that expectations are unraveling. Therefore, we should hike preemptively. It's, it's just very, it's not in the Fed culture to do something like that. So I think that as a consequence, the inaction or the dovish response this year um, would lead to the Fed being even more behind the curve than they are right now. And I think that next year they might have to hike multiple times of 50 bips or like more aggressively next year to catch up. And as a result, that would lead to recession. All right. Um, thank you. Eleanor, let's bring you in on this. Your, your focus of reporting is a little different, uh, which is why this is a great panel, right? So you focus a lot on the effect of the economy and the world events on employment related issues. Yep. Could, how could a more aggressive reaction from the Fed impact employment? So right now the Fed's unemployment or rates are near zero, which is actually helping to boost growth. And part of the reason why I think that they have been a little more cautious in recent months has been that they really are trying to give the labor market an opportunity to recover from the pandemic. Um, you know, Powell said on the Hill this week that they are sticking to that very gradual increase. You know, they're not planning to act too aggressively. It was unusual for him to come out with so much clarity on that. Um, um, but workers, advocates, and Democrats are definitely concerned that if prices get higher, uh, the Fed will have to react more aggressively. And, you know, that could affect the job market. You know, it could lead to pay cuts. It could lead to layoffs. Um, it is a bit of a balancing act because right now, you know, even though we've seen wages hit a record high, we've also seen prices kind of outpace that. And so the Fed has this unique opportunity, I think, to even if they are hampering uh, wages a little, they might be able to actually increase take home pay by bringing inflation down. So I think it'll probably be a matter for them, I would guess, of um, trying to weigh those two things against each other so that they're not kind of robbing workers of what really has been like an unprecedented, you know, time of growth after the uh, pandemic recession. Thank you. All right. Now that we've all shaken off and gotten loose here, I'm just going to throw out questions, um, but stick on inflation and workers for right now. Uh, any, as we look around and you're talking, you go to the grocery store and everything is more expensive, go to fill up your car and it's $4 um, per gallon for 87. Like what products beyond gas and basic commodities um, should we be anticipating big price increases? 
Oh, I can hop in on that. Uh, or no, John, do you want to answer it? Well, I was just going to say, I did a lot of reporting a couple of months ago about how inflation, because it does have this disparate impact on goods, affects low income workers, you know, much more than higher income workers. Not only do they have less household wealth, uh, but they also are more heavily reliant on those goods, you know, like gas that we're looking at realistically increasing dramatically in price. Um, you know, more than that, they also have less, less, less flexibility to seek out cheaper goods. You know, they're already going to the cheapest grocery store. They maybe don't have the means to seek out other outlets. Uh, so I think that, that that is probably one of the biggest dangers for our government as they look at how to address this trend of inflation is making sure that it's not you know hitting the people that Biden campaigned on helping. So I'll, I'll throw out a, a couple of additional thoughts on this about um, where are we likely to see this hit. Um, I, I the, the short answer to that is we don't really know. I mean, so there's there, there's there's two related uh, answers to that. One is that there's this idea in economics that um, a, a pass through uh, over the last 20, 30 years, it was the case because we were in this disinflationary environment where when there was an energy price shock, there wasn't much pass through to other uh, to, to other goods and services, but it feels like that's kind of changed over the last couple of years, that companies are under more pressure in part because labor markets are so tight. So we could see more pass through into things like the cost of an airline flight. Um, the other thing I'd say is that, that what we've seen uh, during the COVID shock is that there are vulnerable points in the supply in global supply chains that could hit almost anything. The thing I'm looking at right now is a commodity people haven't thought about, palladium. Um, Russia is a very big supplier of palladium to the world, uh, accounting for something like, I think, 25% of global palladium. All right, well, this didn't matter much a couple of years ago. There was plentiful supplies of palladium. But now that might be under uh, constraint. Well, palladium is a major ingredient in catalytic converters that go into cars. We don't get catalytic converters being exported to uh, American automakers. It can't run uh, their supply lines, and car price supplies could the car supplies could be uh, held up, and it could affect car prices once again. So global supply chains are very, very uh, sensitive to these shocks, very diverse, and we could we could see spikes in areas that no one is expecting. Yeah, so so, so uh, just wanting to um, add to this. So uh, being the macroeconomist here, I would focus on the macro side of things. I, I mean, um, so so labor costs account for what seventy to eighty percent of business costs. So with uh, wages going at five or six percent right now, which is the highest in forty years, um, the question is as. John said, whether there'll be passed through to prices. And um, in the past 20 years, there has not been uh, wage passed through to, to prices. And why is that? Because expectations of inflation is anchored at 2%. Whenever somebody wants to raise the prices, the competitors don't and they lose market share so they couldn't do it. But today the issue is um, if there's a wage price spiral, that is, which is the greatest fear of the Fed, then what you could be starting to see is that there will be, um, you know, price tick up in 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 uh, prices, and I think in the past in the in last month's CPI, what's most striking to me is how you're starting to see that some of those, um, you know, supposedly transitory increase in goods is flowing to service core services, uh, for example. Um, you know, we know, all know about uh, cars, auto price of surge, 40% last year. How is it flowing into core services? Through insurances prices. Now insurances have to, you know, charge more for premium because of higher price of cars. Same with health insurance, the same of home insurances because our cost of lumber prices. So all that is like flowing into core services and also you know, businesses are reporting that they're passing through wages, uh, wage increase to prices, and then you you're seeing all these costs of adjustment uh, um, uh, to 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 uh, workers' wages as as workers negotiate 
for um, you know several years down the line what what their wage increase should be and that actually leads to multi-year increase that's higher than before and and I, I so I, I think that for things that we haven't seen yet it, is, are all these like widespread pass through to of higher wages and goods prices to to actual service prices, and um, uh, and 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 I think that even if this year you do see some trans like decline slow down in in inflation because you know cars can't keep on increasing at forty percent per year that would just be a temporary good news because I, I think that the trajectory of uh, like um, inflation be it goes down somewhat and then but it would be staying at like three or four percent at a sticky way in the next couple of years. Heather if I could jump in with, with, Go with one it. additional thought related to what Anne is talking about. Um, I, I think real estate is a really interesting uh, area right now because um, you know interest rates are so low uh, you, you don't get a great return if you invest in a bond. Real estate prices are, are rising with double-digit rates in many places. You know, the, the, and you know, I'm starting to hear these anecdotes of people saying, this is just crazy what's happening in my market. And I mean, real estate is a complicated issue because it doesn't translate direct, directly into formal consumer price indices. The, the government statisticians kind of separate real estate out into an investment asset and a consumer asset, right? So we live in our homes and we get some service out of that, but we also have an investment component to it. So, you know, we, we could see the, uh, the the consumer price aspect of real estate going up too on the form of higher rents. Uh, and, and I think it's just a, a part of the economy that's kind of so fundamental to how we live and how we invest. I think there's going to be a lot of stories in real estate in the next year. Thank you. I want to circle back to one thing actually, uh, real quick about that wage price spiral. So this is something I've done a lot of reporting on lately. And it's interesting because even though our job market right now has a few characteristics that do make that wage price spiral we saw a few decades ago a little bit less likely, you know, union membership is down, so we don't have those cost of living agreements. Um, there are some factors that do make it, you know, more likely. We have uh, the obviously the COVID relief packages that were passed and we have a record high number of job openings, which has led to a high rate of job switching, which the Chicago Fed said a couple of weeks ago is pushing up prices. Um, and so I think uh, my sense from the economists I've spoken to is that the thing to watch is really whether or not these wage and price increases become more widespread. It sounds like right now they're concentrated in a few industries, uh, but if we start seeing wages go up consistently across the board, prices go up across the board, I think that's the sign that we're getting that two-way causality that really defines a wage spiral. Um, and we're seeing you know workers ask for those higher wages so that they can afford higher prices. It's like, it's that's my impression is that that's the piece we're missing right now. Thank you. All right, let's shift our conversation a bit. I feel like we could talk about inflation and <laughs> all day. Uh, we're hearing a lot of the news about sanctions, right? Sanctions on Russia, individuals within the country, on Russian banks and businesses. Let me just throw this out there. Are sanctions severe enough? And what are some workarounds that are possible for them? Yeah, I, I can answer this, this question. Um, so in my previous life, before I cover US economy, I, I was on the international side of things at Treasury and the Fed and White House. So on this topic, I think that the sanctions, if, if I have to rate it in terms of severity from zero to 10, 10 being the worst, I think right now we're still at eight. Um, and um, is it severe enough? Well, um, is it severe enough to deter Russia no. Um, is it severe enough compared to the normal state of things, uh, like no normal, like the no normal ways of, um, you know, how U.S. tend to punish bad bad actors on the in international stage? Um, sort of average. So I think what's unprecedented about this, uh, these sanctions, is not like the severity of them by itself, but, but what's unprecedented is the coordination. So in 2014, and even with Iran, um, 
the the U.S. had you know wanted to do more severe sanctions, but euro euro, euro areas always it's very hard to get them on on board of things. But this time, you know, you even have Switzerland uh, declare abandoning their neutrality, which is like really special. And in the past, when U.S. wants to kick people out of SWIFT, we never got the support of Belgians or or you know other European actors. So the coordination part is unprecedented. Second part that's un unprecedented is is just uh, that we have never really used these these level of sanction tools on an economy as big as Russia, um, and which would have a lot of impact on our European allies, and which will have spillback effect to the U.S. economy. That's more unpredictable than in the past. Um, but where where the sanctions could be more severe is. And we have seen more severe sanctions on other countries, like on Iran. So, for example, um, uh, secondary sanctions on uh, third parties that's not within, not directly under U.S. jurisdictions. For example, obviously chi China would be helping Russia to bypass these sanctions. And in the past, when we have sanctions on North Korea, when Chinese firms and banks try to to supply dollars or uh, help help. North Korea bypass trade sanctions. Uh, the OFAC actually imposed sanctions on those Chinese banks and firms. So right now that loophole is still there. And second, the carve out for oil and gas, it, it's still, it, I remain skeptical how painful this could be to, to, to Russia as long as that big you know the Russian gas is the meat of, of of Russian economy, and and you know with evasion you can always fake some invoicing that you know you're you're engaging in oil and gas trade, and you know that's how you evade sanctions. So as long as those two loopholes are not closed, I still think that we're you know we have way more more to go to be really severe. I have so many uh, questions on SWIFT and oil that I'm going to get to. John, did you want to jump in before I ask? Uh, a couple quick points. Um, it, it was striking to me this morning, these stories about French authorities seizing the yacht of, a, uh, of an oligarch. And um, I, you know, I think that's kind of evidence of uh, how aggressively some of these uh, authorities kind of want to apply these sanctions, not just to uh, the Russian government and um, the Russian economy, but to, like to the people who really have Vladimir Putin's ear. You know, the, the other thing, I, you know, th th there's also so many different ways this can spin. Uh, I think there's skepticism about whether sanctions will work, but in the case of Iran, it, they really do seem to have brought Iran to the table during the Obama administration. And I wonder how Iran's going to come back and play into this. Uh, you know, Iran is also a major supplier of global oil. Uh, did, did the U.S. and Europe uh, accelerate their efforts to get back to a negotiating table with Iran to bring them back into the fold as they simultaneously try to isolate uh, Russia? I think that's a question worth pursuing. So one of the things that's been in the news a lot before this happened was the stress supply chains across the country, right, and across the world. And so my question probably for um, Anna would be, how do these stress supply chains deal with sanctions and companies that are self-sanctioning and just the conflict in general? The way that they have been dealing with it the last two years or even the last five years. So um, the supply, the thought on, on you know, the, what, when, when US firms started um, thinking, rethinking about their supply chains was during the trade war, and the pandemic actually um, accelerated those plans. Because during the trade war with China, it became already clear that there's too much reliance there, and so, so even then, U.S. firms and other firms around the world was already thinking of, you know, uh, uh, moving their their uh, their their production either to the, other places in Asia or bringing it back to Western hemisphere. And I know, and even within the White House, they were thinking about subsidizing US firms and, you know, uh, to bring plants back, um, you know, a couple of years ago. So the pandemic only accelerated those plans. And right now, um, uh, firms are, you know, just 
uh, increasing the inventories because inventory to sales level is at like 30 years low. And just by um, stockpiling and uh, increasing the inventory, uh, they could, you know, be more, more protected against future shock. But the ironic thing is by stockpiling, it sort of lead to more supply chain bottlenecks and, and uh, you know, it's, it's making it harder for this log jam to clear when everybody's piling it and trying to double duplicate their orders. And uh, for you, Eleanor, how does that affect workers? Right? <laughs> Definitely doesn't help the situation. Um, I've also, so we have every uh, few years, uh, the contract between the employers that run the ports on the West Coast and the union that represents all of their dock workers expires. You know, last time it was up in 2014, it led to tons of supply chain disruptions. Um, yeah, lots of, lots of issues. And so we are seeing that come up again as the contract expires July 1st. And so they're thinking of kicking off negotiations anytime between now and June. Um, and I think that that is going to be a really tricky line for the Biden administration to walk. You know, I think on the one hand, we have Biden as this self-described union man. He appointed a former union president as his labor uh, secretary, but it could potentially make all of these other forces that we're talking about um, that much more, you know, aggressive and deadly, for lack of a better word, because of, you know, how it could exacerbate the supply chain issues that we're already seeing if we add this other, you know, log to the fire. Does the West have a good exit strategy from sanctions? Does the West have? <laughs> yeah, like what's the next <laughs> step here? We see, uh, well, we see more I mean, I every think, single day. I think, so. it, I think it depends on, I, I think it really depends on Vladimir Putin's behavior. Uh, um, you, you know, if, if he pursues this war and it drags on, then I think that the West is going to stick to those sanctions. And, um, you know, it, it certainly hurts Europe and countries like Germany the most because they've become so dependent on, uh, on Russian oil and natural gas. But, um, you know, they're searching around now for alternatives. Uh, and at the same time, you know, the, 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 I, I think it's gonna be hard to pull these back as long as Russia has a footprint in the Ukraine. And if it, you know, if it puts its own puppet government there, then it's going to be really hard, and then it's just going to be a question of you know how long Europe is prepared to deal with that economic pain as it adapts. And I mean, I think what we've seen in Europe's response to what Putin has done is that they're a lot more serious about this crisis uh, than they were, you know, cases like North Korea, or Iran, because it's right at their doorstep. You know, like Poland is the next state over. And so we've seen Germany, for, for instance, literally in a matter of 48 hours, change its entire post-World uh, War II defense strategy uh, because it feels threatened by what Russia is doing. So the message that I think the European leaders are sending is they're serious and they're gonna stick, they're gonna deal with, tolerate the economic pain uh, to, to send a clear message to, to the Russians that, uh, that, that his, uh, that Putin's advancements aren't gonna go unpunished. I wanna follow up on that actually. Um, so to your point, we've seen recent actions um, show this dichotomy, right? Between the Western democracies and others and how they are responding to this invasion. And as we look at our really globalized economy um, and this globalization of international institutions, what does this say about things like the WTO, the IMF, the World Bank? Well, I mean, I think what we've seen over the last few years is that countries like China and Russia um, don't necessarily want to play according to those rules. Frankly, I think they have as much, if not more, to lose economically uh, by spurning those kind of global agreements and global organizations because they still have very export-driven economies. Uh, you know, 
really, uh, you, you kind of have to weigh their economic aspirations against the, um, the, the incentives of autocratic leaders and their willingness to impose uh, economic pain on their own people to secure their own place in power. And I think uh, that that willingness uh, to impose economic pain on their own people um, uh, perhaps can be pretty great, particularly in the case of Russia. But, you know, there might be stress points that they haven't foreseen. Um, Bloomberg and others reported earlier today that the European Union is seeking to remove Russia's most favored nation status at the World Trade Organization, which could further hit um, Moscow's, you know, exports to that block with tariffs. And there's pending legislation in the U.S. to revoke Russia's permanent normal trade relations status, um, which would also authorize uh, President Biden to raise tariffs on Russian goods. What are the implications that these measures would have on critical sectors within the U.S. and Europe? Anna, you want to take that one? Uh, <laughs> okay, okay, I'll try. Okay, so, um, you know, our U.S. direct linkages to Russian trade, Ukraine trade, Ukrainian trade is very limited, um, but, there are certain sectors which has long uh, supply chains, like uh, so, and, and car, auto is one of them. And, uh, you know, autos, once I read a report that says, um, uh, to make a car, you need like over 2000 pieces. And when you lack one piece, you, you know, suspend the whole production. And so with, uh, you know, we are already seeing signs that even though Ukraine is just a tiny trade partner with US, the supply chain effect is already filtering to autos making. So I could imagine that, you know, by, by putting tariffs on Russian goods, um, which would, you know, affect, directly affect food uh, prices and metal prices and metals play into cars and housing construction. So that would raise the, that, that will not do, do good to US inflation. Um, yeah, I'm not sure whether, I mean, it, it is certainly that sort of policy certainly would shoot ourselves on our own foot too, as, as much as, I mean, it would be worse for R Russia, but it also hurts us in terms of inflation. Yeah, producers, I mean, if they can't get the supplies they need, they have to pause production, they have to lay off workers. We saw this when we had those microchip shortages. I mean, there were multiple auto companies that had to temporarily shut down production lines and for low workers. So yeah, definitely, like Anna said, I think there would be some negative ramifications for American workers as well. I, I, I think um, this kind of opens a question of how does China play in all of this? So. China is Russia's biggest importer uh, of goods, in particular commodities, because um, you know Russia pulls a lot of stuff out of the ground and sends it as raw materials uh, to the Chinese. And so the question becomes: uh, Is China going to play along with uh, with the West uh, in imposing a cost on the Russians, or is it going to take the side of Russia? You know, or try to maintain a neutral stance. Um, and, and, and that's where the relationship between Putin and Xi is really interesting, right? So Putin was over there during the Olympics, uh, sitting next to President Xi. Uh, Putin uh, and, and Xi kind of came out with a statement about their, uh, their, their um, national alliances. The question now is like, how, how, Far into this, do, do the Chinese want to go? It's a it's a fascinating geopolitical question, and uh, we we actually have a really good story on my colleague Lin Lin Wei. I think it's on the website right now that looks at that. So anyone who's out there, I would I would recommend you read it. Nobody understands uh, Chinese leadership thinking more than Lin Lin. Yeah, in fact, she did such a good job covering the country that they kicked her out. Uh, how you know? Yeah, and, and, and I, I totally agree with John in that, in both aspects that one, uh, China is the critical issue in terms of how painful that these sanctions could be for Russia and two, Ling Ling's report, reporting is excellent and amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I also think my, my sense of how, I used to cover uh, China at the Fed also. So, so 
and I remember how China tried to do dodge the sanctions during the North Korea uh, situation. And, you know, they would say they would deny uh, that they are trading with North Korea, but satellite images which show Chinese boats lining up in, along the, uh, in, in the sea and also Chinese trucks lining up at the bridge, you know, trying to ship things to to uh, to to North Korea. So so there's like and, th and this would definitely rely on reporters, like whether you could you know, find the facts to support that evasion is happening, even though they would deny it that it's happening. And second, it also depends on the political will of the, the Biden administration, the National Security Council, U.S. Treasury, in imposing, closing the loophole, China loophole on the sanctions. So, you know, it had been done before. So when when evidence surfaced that a Chinese, a Chinese bank is helping North Koreans, uh, you know, uh, uh, get dollars, the U.S. imposed secondary sanction on that bank, Chinese bank. Um, so right now, we already could see that some the big Chinese banks are afraid of secondary sanctions, given the presidents with them. North Korea. And so so they're already voluntarily withdrawing from touching anything Russia related to Russians. But um, the question remained whether the smaller banks or smaller Chinese entities would still want to do it. And and again, with China, it's very tricky because the leaders would say one thing, but it's up to really the reporters to find the facts to support the truth. Anna, can, can I ask a question? I'm sorry, uh, Heather, if I'm hijacking this, but what you no, said no, no, go for it. Is it's, really, it's really <laughs> fascinating to me. So um, I just want to ask you, Anna, to put yourself in the head of Chinese leadership right now. So uh, China became the world's second largest economy, you know, in large part by putting itself right in the middle of the global supply chain as the factory floor to the world. Uh, and, and Chinese leadership, ha you know, has to be aware of, of how central it is to economic stability to stay in that place. So, how do you think they're thinking about this crisis right now? And in terms, in terms of what side do they want to be on? And in terms of how uh, aggressively they want to confront the West, which is at the end of the day. The country's main customer for all the stuff that it creates. Yeah, I think I think they're trying to buy time. I think the Chinese leadership, since the trade war happened under Trump, they have been crafting a way forward to lessen the reliance on the West. So, you know, a couple of years ago, um, she unveiled this internal circulation, or sometimes it's been translated as, as dual circulation, which is basically to pivot um, the economic um, driver of the Chinese economy to domestic uh, economy. I think over time, the, the Chinese uh, leadership wants the domestic economy to be the driver. And it just happens that during the pandemic, it, uh, its external demand suddenly became the key driver of the Chinese economy, again, because of the zero COVID strategy of China. But mm -hmm. but the longer term, and um, you know the, the leadership has already written extensively on, on this since four or five years ago, is to one, um, rely on domestic economy for demand. And that's why they're hitting the housing sector hard because they, they know that the high housing values in China is crimping uh, consumption. And so, you know, they, they see like the current um, hit on the, the uh, uh, housing sector as paving for longer term stability for the economy to drive domestic demand. And second, the lessen the reliance on dollar financing. So, you know, they have been slowly diversifying out of the dollar reserves. They've been trying to get companies to uh, uh, invoice in renminbi. They're, you know, writing contracts on, on oil and gas stuff. But uh, that's but, invoice. And, and, and I'd like to jump in. If they were really serious about this, wouldn't they allow the yuan to appreciate? Like that, like, like that's a single lever that they could use to push the economy towards less export orientation and more domestic consumption. And they have let the yuan uh, appreciate. It, it, that, that is what's so amazing about last year is typically when Chinese economy slowed down, the, um, you know, the renminbi would depreciate and there's 
capital flight from China. But that didn't happen last year. In fact, the worst uh, hit to the growth was third quarter of last year when growth was like growing at 2% annualized. And yet you saw net capital inflows and the RMB was appreciated against uh, the dollar. Even now, they still have appreciation pressure uh, on the RMB. So I think I think that that since 20, we are a long way from 2015, 2016, when when you know we saw capital flight from China and uh, the RMB was depreciated. Right now, the uh, the central bank in China, from you know from my 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 being you know away from China reporting for a while now, but but. From what I see, I think PBOC is refraining from intervening or uh, keeping the the renminbi down. Um, since we spun back to sanctions, I want to pull a question from the chat that we've gotten. Um, what is the likelihood that the sanctions will be so crippling to Russia that it will force Putin to complete the invasion within a period of three to six months rather than a much longer time frame of around a year or beyond? I mean, I personally think with every day that goes by, uh, his deals become more sunk in. It's like it's a sunk cost. It would be very hard for him to walk away from this at this point without losing um, a lot of face and credibility. So, uh, you know, it, it, it seems to me the pressure is on him, sadly, to increase his bombardment of these cities. Uh, and, um, you know, like we're, we're, I'm seeing stories right now that this is something that could drag on for years, uh, if not a decade or more. Um, so it, it, uh, I, I mean, that three to six months, I, I, I don't think this is going to be over in three to six months. Yeah, I, I think that the critical variable that can raise the cost on, on Russia may not even be sanctions. It would be U.S. shale producer back in 2014. I mean, on hindsight, when people re evaluate the effectiveness of sanctions in 2014, they say it's not that effective. But whereas it's the collapse in oil price that's more effective. And back then, who who caused the collapse of oil price? U.S. shale. And right now, you know, there's only like 500, 600 active wells in the U.S. compared to like 1,900 back in 2014. Of course, the wells are. Are more productive now, but that is to say that there is still a lot of, um, um, you know, unused capacity in the U.S. shale, and 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 you know, you're still seeing news that the Biden administration has halted uh, drilling in federal lands, and so I, I have to wonder if you just unleash that U.S. power of the U.S. shale, then um, that we would be fracking. Uh, Russia out of business. <laughs> I, I think that's a that's a really interesting and important point, and it's an example of how like these shocks can ripple through the economy in ways that people aren't necessarily expecting. I actually just wrote a story about this the other day. U.S. rip counts are rising, uh, and they, they rose at an accelerating pace uh, in in the last month or so. And it's possible that this supply shock actually creates more drilling in the United States uh, and, and thus, you know, more e economic output in the U.S. and more employment through the energy sector, which I think nobody would have expected from a Biden administration, but it might be the economic reaction to what's going on in, in Russia. From a journalistic perspective, I think, you know, th this is, that's a great example of how, you know, as reporters, we just have to follow the story. Uh, and kind of look for new leads and, and, and where they take us. They always take us in interesting directions. There's always a good story out there to follow. That's a great one. I'm going to stick with uh, oil and energy since you guys are all excited um, and clearly have a lot to talk about on this. So we know that Russian energy exports are a relatively small part of U.S. oil imports. But how do you see potential bans on Russian oil impacting prices globally in the long term? Globally, so so the, you know the oil, the oil and gas market in in the global in economy, from my perspective, is not integrated yet due to the difficulties in shipping 
natural gas and oil everywhere, especially with supply chain issues now. It's hard to get the ships and containers and pipelines and all that. So, so prices are kind of like uh, still segmented, which is why U.S. WTI is lower than you know for the, for the cost of a barrel of Brent crude oil. But um, the way I, th I see it is. Well, uh, it depends on uh, what Europe does. So if Europe decides to accelerate the transition to renewable energy and just completely abandon the reliance on traditional oil and gas, then they would be suffering for a while until you know the re renewable uh, energy you know, uh, comes online. And in the meantime, the price for traditional you know, fossil fuels would increase uh, and stay elevated. And then they would also rely on imports from the U.S., which kind of helps drive the U.S. domestic gas and uh, oil price higher because we're, we, we are facing more demand competition from Europe. However, if Europe embrace uh, fossil fuels back again, <laughs> then um, and, and the U.S. Uh, fossil fuel uh, energy, uh, you know, the sector deems that, well, we should invest more because right now there's an underinvestment in, in the sector because they, it's, it feels uncertain what the future demand would be. But if Europe makes a clear signal to the U.S. sector that, you know, you know, please invest more and, and U.S. government also tells the sector so, then I think that the you know we could see oil prices coming down even without uh, reliance on Russian gas if U.S. were to fully embrace pumping their, their oil. I, I think there's a short-term and a long-term reaction to this, right? So in the short term, the capacity of the world to, uh, to, to run its machines uh, it is oriented towards fossil fuels. So there's going to be a short-term uh, demand for American fracking, potentially Iranian oil through uh, a, a renewed uh, nuclear arms deal. But I do think that in the long run, this is a clear signal event to Europe and to other countries uh, to, to move towards cleaner fuels, not, not only because they're cleaner, but because they reduce our dependence on adversarial states like the Russians. So I think this benefits fracking in the short run, uh, and that's kind of more of a short run asset anyway, and, and certainly clean energy uh, in the long run. I, I, I think I haven't looked at it in the last few days that that, that clean energy stocks are actually rising. Uh, there's going to be money going into that capacity. It already was, uh, and this is a signal event that more needs to go. Yeah, we've heard a lot from progressives lately about who have been arguing that Russia's dominance in this oil and gas market is a big reason to get off of fossil fuels, and this could be the time that that gets some traction, maybe. Right. It, yeah, potentially, but but it would be naive to think that you could do it overnight. I mean, there has to be some place <clears throat> to another place, and that's still in fossil fuel. But, but John, to respond to you, to what you just said, the irony is that the, the um, you know American frackers are not go going to ramp up their investment or pump more if they don't get a signal that or reassurance that you know it's a medium term thing. I mean, you you can't just tell them, you know, we are just gonna uh, re temporarily rely on you guys, and then in a year or two we'll transition to clean energy. And then the, the, the incentive is the, the signal right now in prices, right? If you've got hundred and ten dollar a barrel of oil, like you know, there's there's like the the, the marginal profit on that uh, is a stronger incentive than it used to be. Now, you know, the forecast might be for it to go down. Yeah. But but on the margin, you know, and these wells, I mean, I don't fully know the economics of, of this drilling, but the wells, I think, tend to be more short lived than, you know, old wild wells in the Gulf of Mexico. So, you know, it might be that the economics and the price signal is enough to get a little bit more drilling out of those places. A little bit more is the key. It will get you. It will, <laughs> it will boost uh, supply by a little bit more, but not where it could be to drive Russia out of the game. You know, you you need like forty dollars per barrel decrease in prices to really, uh, or more than that to to impose pain on Russia. If you drill a little bit more, that will decrease price by like ten dollars per barrel. Not that doesn't do much. Um, if we do block Russian oil and if, you know, that does make gas prices go up, I guess my question for you, Anna, would be, 
uh, how would we see that affect expectations and thus, you know, the possibility of this kind of wage price spiral? Because it would seem to me that that would really throw lighter fluid on the fire. Yeah, I personally think that the risk for a wage price spiral and expectations on anchoring with this, uh, with, if oil goes to 120 or 150 per barrel is extremely high. But it's the sort of thing that you only can see long after it started happening, you know, especially from a central bank's pers perspective. And, and central bankers are by nature very uh, conservative and cautious and very data dependent. And right now the knowledge on, on what forms expectations and what caused them to change and can you predict uh, inflation expectations unraveling. I, I think it's it, it will be very hard for the Fed, Fed to be on time and react like at a timely manner to this. Yeah, you know, it, it, economists have gotten kind of so anchored to the idea of expectations over the last 30 years and, you know, come to this conclusion that people's expectations of the future kind of drive everything. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm also like Anna, uh, a bit suspicious about the whole line of thinking on this. I kind of feel like expectations kind of are stable until they're not. And uh, they have been for the last 20 or 30 years because there have been all these forces that have kept inflation down, right? So hundreds of millions of Chinese workers and, and workers entering the labor force kept inflation down. So therefore people expected less inflation. Uh, you know, and then central bankers say, oh, look, we kept inflation expectations at this. Well, you know, they could turn very quickly. Uh, and this is the kind of environment that could make that happen. So I, I don't think that they're a leading indicator. I think they're potentially a lagging indicator. And it could be kind of the next place where central bankers kind of have too much faith in an old model that doesn't work anymore. You all have talked about how these changes don't happen overnight, right? Like they're, we, they take a little bit of time, right? So as we are seeing very high gas prices and the possibility of that going higher, what can or should the Biden administration do to lower gas prices, especially since releasing oil from the strategic um, petroleum reserve didn't immediately work? As I, you know, as I mentioned right now, the, just now that the most important variable is how much U.S. shale is producing, right. and to get U.S. shale producers to want to invest more, and the key is removing uncertainty for them in the future. Um, that's that's what economists would say. It's uh, re, the re, the Biden administration can announce that, you know, uh, we are. <laughs> We are embracing the fossil fuels again, and to to you know, to build expectations to U.S. shale producers that the demand is still here to stay, you know, for to stay, um, and uh, loosen the regulations on drilling and on federal land, something like that. That would be more effective than re, uh, releasing the petroleum reserves. Well, you know, so if I can say one other quick thing about that, I, I think the best thing the Biden administration could do for the American economy uh, doesn't have to do with, with energy or oil. If they actually want to pass in uh, a shift towards greener energy, then they wouldn't be doing a lot to, to increase production. If they want to relieve inflationary pressures, what they could do is allow more immigration uh, because then companies would have workers uh, would have a larger pool of workers to choose from, and that would relieve some of the upward pressure on wages. Um, I'm not a policymaker, but if I was, this would be my magic wand to end the war and end inflation. <laughs> I think we should send. Uh, I think we should send um, customs officials to the border of Ukraine and Russia, and offer offer uh, refugee visas to all these 20 year old soldiers that Putin is sending into war say, come to America, you know, we'll give you a, a visa and, uh, you know, you can, you can work um, in, in America and, uh, you know, any number of jobs we need to have filled, uh, take other countries' uh, human capital, like Russians, and take away his army. I think, I think we could, we, tomorrow we could get, if we handed out 25,000 refugee visas 
uh, at the border, um, we could deplete Putin, Putin's forces uh, overnight. And, yeah, and we'd, it's, affect our own, we'd, we'd, we'd affect our own inflation problem. And I hope you'll tell your old friends at the Treasury that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now they know. <laughs> Eleanor, did you want to jump in? Yeah, so as a, I mean, as a labor policy reporter, something that my editors and, you know, what sources and others have been asking is what can department heads do? And the answer is realistically not much. You know, I sat down with Marty Walsh at the end of January and we were talking about this and, you know, they can kind of do some things tangentially. They can focus on supply chains, which he's done, you know, Biden started an apprenticeship program to help train more truck drivers. Um, but beyond that, their hands are pretty much tied. But that was a good point about immigration. You know, we saw even before we started to see this trend of inflation that um, visas were very, very short in supply. They've already raised the cap, but that's the number one thing. You know, if you talk to business groups about worker shortages is they want more visas, you know, they want more means to bring people over. And I think that that's one of the things that I certainly am going to be tracking um, as this conflict progresses is whether or not the Biden administration decides to grant TPS or temporary protected status to Ukrainians. I mean, I don't know about Russian soldiers, but definitely that would be that would be a solution to, again, that tight labor market that we're seeing push prices up. So we are um, almost running out of time, and I want to switch back over to SWIFT for a few minutes, uh, which we talked about just in passing earlier. So a few days ago, um, as was noted, we had all these major countries, including Brussels, right, pledge to cut off some Rus Russian banks from the SWIFT messaging um, financial system. Uh, and that connects all the banks um, around the world. So, but some European countries have expressed concern that if Russia was kicked off of SWIFT, that they could set up like a parallel system with other countries like Iran. Is that something that we need to be worried about? Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. I, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think they already have set it up. They tried since 2014, but the take up wasn't good. And um, I think with the Iranian sanctions, uh, Europe was also trying to set up an alternative payment system, but it was very hard to get around it. So I think the challenges to get around it, it is extreme. I think that it's overstated. It's been overstated. The, the, I mean, the fact of the matter is the global economy runs on dollars. And, uh, you know, un until that's no longer the fact, you know, if you want to participate in the system, uh, then you're going to have to do transactions in dollars. So North Korea has made a decision that it doesn't want to participate in the system. They're living with the consequences. Uh, the, the Iranians uh, felt the pain of not participating in the system, and they came to the table uh, with the U.S. and did a deal uh, with the Obama administration. You could argue about the terms of the deal, but they did come to the table. And, you know, I, I think the question that the Russians are going to have to face is, do we want to participate in the system or not? Which is one of the reasons why I think it's so important to, to, to watch as journalists what's happening on the streets of Russia. And, and whether you know there's there's any um, observable evidence that that people are pressing back against a regime successfully uh, to to alter their policies, it's hard for them to do that because they put down protests and they jail and poison their dissidents. But um, you know, I, I I think that's that's the question. Uh, the ruble is collapsing, inflation is going up. There's pressure on them because they participated in a global economic system driven by dollars and they're alienating themselves from that system. Um, as we close out, I wanna give one final question from the chat. How long do you think um, post-war, whatever the post-war period looks like, that it will take for the West to trust Russia again to the point where it's investable? Who knows? I mean, I think a lot depends on what happens over, over the next couple of months. Uh, but I do think, I mean, that's kind of a, a, um, a flip answer. I, I, I do think that, I've used this term before, there are signal events that, that, that happen. Signals that are sent out to boardrooms, to CEOs. You know, I think the Trump tariffs were one of those signals. Uh, I think these Russian, uh, this Russian incursion into Europe was a major signal event uh, to, to European leaders 
um, that they have to rethink the way they, they do business. And um, I mean, Putin's feet are so sunk in, I don't think it's gonna be hard for him to extract, him, extract himself from the situation. And so I think this is a signal event that you don't trust Russia in the marketplace and that you know we're, we're gonna be writing about how this kind of changed the nature of business for a long time. I'm more pessimistic than John about human nature. And I think I fundamentally, I <laughs> I, I'm more, I think, I think the Wall Streeters are more uh, driven by greed and suppose that Russia plunged Europe into a uh, recession and, you know, uh, five years from now, US and Euro area in QE again, facing zero interest rate. There's, you know, not and risk on mode is on again and Wall Street trying to chase yields. Russia offers 20% uh, returns and want to go for it. Okay, well, this will wrap things up for us. Uh, we have covered a ton this afternoon. I would like to give a huge thank you to Anna and Eleanor and John for your time and your insights, uh, to Matt, to Cebu for having all of us. Um, to the audience, please check out sebu.org for a listing of future events, including our monthly virtual training sessions and interviews with legendary business journalists. A reminder that we will have the session available on Cebu's on-demand page tomorrow. On behalf of Cebu, thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon, and please enjoy the rest of your week. <laughs>